There's differences between the uh, New American Standard Bible 1995 and the New American Standard Bible 2020. And here's the thing. How do you memorize verses from a Bible that in 15, 20 years, 25 years, they're going to be different? It's not possible to do. Because then you have to you have to uh, you have to re memorize them again, okay? And churches and and many of them still do. Um, I know in the Free Will Baptist den denomination, which we used to be a part of, they would have uh, for the young people uh, different Bible contests. And one of those was, of course, uh, Bible drills, Bible sword drills. Who remembers doing Bible sword drills? Okay. You hold the Bible like this. Thumbs on the, and then they call out, okay, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 1, charge. And whoever gets to 1 Corinthians 12, 1, you know, gets the cut, whatever. And then they have Bible memorization. And um, whoever memorized the most verses... Well, here's the problem that, they, that they've been having recently. And I know this because uh, several years ago, some of the Free Will Baptists down in Arkansas wanted uh, my help with this. Was that um, their, in their churches, in their district, they wanted to use, you know, many of them wanted to use the King James. Because everybody's got a King James. But some of the newer pastors... They wanted to go with the English standard version. They had been told that there really isn't that much difference. Well, what is really that much difference? It's a difference. Let me explain to you something. There is a about a 2% difference in the DNA that separates humans from chimpanzees. But that is a big difference. Just that 2% difference is a huge difference. Okay? And uh, bottom line is chimpanzees don't go to heaven. We do. There's something in us that makes us unique. It makes us different. And it makes us self-aware. We can be aware of ourselves and our place in this universe at any given time. A chimpanzee cannot do that. It does not have the soul capacity. Uh, maybe it doesn't have the, uh, the, uh, the, the things in their heart. The, what was I trying to think of a while ago? Neurons. It doesn't have the, maybe it doesn't have the neurons in their heart and the capacity to understand itself. Okay? But we can understand ourselves. So, uh, it makes a difference. And so, so when you have a Bible uh, drill, and you've got some that are memorizing verses out of the King James, some memorizing verses out of the English Standard Version, well, then you have a problem auto uh, automatically. Okay? Because which version are you going to use? And so, they had a meeting down there, and um, pastors that, that uh, the King James guys really thought was going to vote with their side decided to vote against them and jumped sides so that they, they could be seen as going along with everything. We'll go along and we'll get along with everybody. And that's how it was done. And it was issues like that that we decided as a church years ago, we're not leaving. We're going to stand still. And they're the ones who are going to leave us. And that's what's happened over the years. They left us. And uh, but anyway, now now it's a problem of what will the English standard version of the Bible say in 15 years from now? Because they're changing the Greek, the Greek of the Greek New Testament. They're changing the Greek now as we speak. So if you have a Bible, let's say the English Standard Version, 
And it was based upon the 28th edition of the Novum Testamentum Grecium. Um, John, while I'm thinking about it, can you get that baptistry started? We got baptisms to do tomorrow. But anyway, um, if, if your Bible, the English Standard Version, is based upon the 28th edition of the Greek text, what are you going to do when they roll out the 29th edition of the Greek text? It's going to be different, which means you're going to have to go and retranslate your Bible to keep up with the Greek text. And it's a, and it's a money thing. The love of money is still the root of all evil. Amen. Amen. Because now that they've changed the Greek text to the, it'll be, it will be the 29th edition. Once that one comes out of the chute and it's there for all of the uh, publishing companies, they're going to have to go to that edition of the Greek text, which means they're going to have to buy a license to use that Greek text. I mean, you got to pay the people who are the ones who are putting the Greek text together and then you have to pay, you know, pay them as a as a committee. You have to pay for their printing cost and all of that stuff. Then uh, you got to pay uh, to use the Greek text. So that means that if you change your Bible to uh, be adapted to the 29th edition, that means that when you roll out your Bible, you've got to charge more for your Bible. And it just it's always about money. Always about money. You can find that in the scriptures, too. All right. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's we st we ended up talking about being unequally yoked and so on here in um, in Second uh, Corinthians, chapter six. Uh, I want to pick it up in verse, oh, I like this, verse 16. Verse 16, I have it up on the screen. Um, and what agreement at the temple of God with idols is where we left off. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Oh, that sounds so good, doesn't it? It sounds good to me. I've always believed in God. I've just always believed in God. I don't, I don't know why. Um, I, I can kind of remember uh, when we lived up here on Telegraph. I can kind of remember going to church up there maybe vacation bible school or something but uh i don't think that was really it i just think that i always believed in god and um for some reason i just believed that god could hear me when i talked to him and maybe that's just something that God has instilled in me all of my life. If he has, I certainly appreciate him for it. I'm glad he did. Amen. And so uh, I am tickled to death if he chooses uh, this old body to be the temple of the living God. And so anyway, he said, I, I will I will walk and be their God and they shall be my people. In verse 17. Here it is now. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Uh, something that's interesting to me, and I don't know if that I really have an answer to it, but something that's interesting to me is that the Nazarite vow that uh, there was different ways of of uh, up, upholding that vow you could have it uh, on you for an entire life in other words your parents instilled in you that there were things you could do things you could not do 
things that you could touch, things that you could never touch. If your parents were telling you that you, you cannot touch anything that's dead, uh, then they uh, must have felt that you had a Nazarite vow on you from birth and that you basically never touched anything that was dead from the, your earliest memories of life uh, until you die, you never ever touch anything that's dead. But then there was, if someone took a Nazarite vow, let's say they wanted to take it for uh, a matter of weeks. They want, say they wanted to take it for, uh, for, uh, for four weeks or, or seven weeks or uh, for maybe a year or five years or whatever. Uh, they could do that. There was no limit as to how long a person could take a Nazarite vow, to my understanding, and uh, no uh, no amount of time that no short amount of time that which they could take the Nazarite vow. They just if they said I'm going to take it for a week, they took it for a week. They didn't touch anything dead. They didn't drink anything. They didn't drink any wine. They didn't eat, they didn't eat no grapes or raisins or or anything like that. And that's just how they took it. But the idea of God telling us not to touch certain things is an interesting thing to me. To me, it's prophetic. There's something about this that I don't quite understand. And when I don't understand it, I like to bug God I won't say to death because God's never going to die, but I just like to bug God. Amen. He said, call unto me and I'll answer thee. And I'm, so, I'm calling again. I want to know what this means. Not to touch the unclean thing. Let's, let's say that it has something to do with the body of the Antichrist. Hi. Let's. Yes, Gary. Sure. That very well could be. Leprosy is a type of sin. So, yeah, it could have something to do with that. Um, Gary, that didn't help the class in any way, shape, or form, but uh, I'm glad you brought it up anyway. <laughs> Wasn't there always somebody in your class when you were in school that did it like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't touch people that had leprosy. Uh, now, I'm going to throw something else in here. You better be glad... That Christ has forgiven you of your sins. How would you like to be somebody that when you walked in the doors of a church, you had to say to everybody, unclean, unclean, unclean. And it wasn't, had nothing to do with leprosy. It had to do with sin. Okay? Christ forgives sin. Amen. Amen. Uh, but anyway, um, there's I think I think it's very, very possible. There's something about this where um, there is a there is something about the Antichrist that I believe will present itself to the world. Uh, to me, I, I, I see its similarity to the Eucharist. OK. The Eucharist, the, the Catholic Church really is the, the protectors of, of the mysteries of all mysteries. Okay? They are, um, they are preserving doctrines that I absolutely believe that one of these days it's going to be found out that they, they are the preservers of the mystery doctrine of the Antichrist and practically everything about them just it reeks of the religion of the Antichrist. The fact that they are the fact that they're idol worshipers, 
and I mean they are idol worshipers. The fact that they have gods before other God, before God. All of those saints are nothing more than gods that they want you to pray to before you pray to God. Every bit of it is. Um, the, the fact that, um, you know, they've got statues everywhere and yet the commandment says thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Well, there isn't a single saint that they won't make an image of somehow, some way. They're going to make an image of it and they're not going to leave any body out. Uh, I would like to as sort of a um, maybe a sabbatical trip is go to St. Peter Square and just spend days examining the 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 different artwork, the different uh, uh, statues and so on. And uh, could you see my wife sitting there going, come on, hurry up. And I'm sitting there going, ooh, look at that. Look at that. Yeah. So anyway, but it, it would be an interesting thing for me. But anyway, uh, but God says don't touch that. Don't have anything to do with it. Uh, another thing that, that we'll throw in with the Catholic Church, if you turn to your Bible to uh, Acts chapter 15, uh, there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever in my mind that Acts 15 was written specifically concerning the Catholic Church. Without a doubt in my mind, without a doubt. Now, I want to say this. I don't want to be an enemy to anybody that is a Roman Catholic. What I do want to be an enemy of is the doctrines of your church. That's what I want to be an enemy of because your doctrines are precisely what God said don't do or precisely what God said he wants you to do, but you won't do it. Um, so in Acts chapter uh, 15, this is when the Jerusalem council met and there's so much in Acts 15 about um, how the church, how, how the church came together to decide important issues. What's not here in Acts 15 is the Pope. That's what's not here. What else is not here uh, is any cardinals or, or bishops or archbishops. None of them are here either. And so what you have is you have a gathering together of the apostles. You have a gathering together of the elders and just the regular church folk. And they've come to, together to decide something. And it has to do with something that it, to them is all obvious now. And that is, these Gentiles are being saved. And there's no doubt about it. We can't deny that God is saving them because, I mean, my goodness, you can tell the Holy Ghost comes on them because they start speaking in tongues immediately. And so, what do we do about that? And so, um, in verse... Uh, five, there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed saying, that, in other words, they believed in Christ, but they're saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. In other words, we want the law of Moses kept. But the dirty little secret comes out in this meeting, doesn't it? James is going to spill the beans because James is going to say, which laws are those that we kept? Tell, tell us, would you please rise and stand up and tell this entire congregation how it is you guys kept all the laws of Moses perfectly and never made a mistake with one. Never happened. Um, Peter is here 
In verse 7, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Uh, and God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. In other words, he gave the Gentiles the Holy Ghost, just like he gave to us Jews. So tell me then, how does this work? If God wants, if God wants the Gentiles to keep the law of Moses, then why did he give them the Holy Ghost? Because they haven't kept the law of Moses yet. Why did he give them the Holy Ghost? Verse 8, And God which knoweth the hearts bear, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to, to bear. He said it. We weren't able to keep the law. Our fathers weren't able to keep the law. Why should we put a yoke upon their neck that we didn't carry? Bet you could have heard a pin drop in that meeting. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to... Uh, Barnabas and Paul declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had uh, held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, uh, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and will set it up. And the residue uh, of men might seek, out, uh, seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. I want you to remember that God always intended to speak to the Gentiles. I want you to remember that. Known unto God, yeah, amen. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. My, wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from among them the Gentiles are turned to God. But we write unto them, here, watch these four things. That we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, first thing. There goes all your Catholic churches. And from fornication... You know, there goes half of your <laughs> Catholic churches. And from things strangled, which means it was hung. It was hung to kill it. And from blood, there goes the rest of the Catholic church. At least three things. Uh, pollutions of idols... Things, things strangled and to withstand from blood. So in the Catholic Church, they offer their sacrifice in front of or right before an idol. That's a no-no. God won't accept it. Then they tell everybody that that which they're eating uh, has been hung on a cross. It's the body of Jesus Christ. You must eat it. That's also a no-no. Then they tell everybody, this cup, we have hocus pocus turned it into the blood, the literal blood of Jesus. That prohibits them from drinking it. Because they're not to drink. We learned we weren't supposed to drink blood all the way back in Genesis chapter 9. You don't drink blood. So out of the four things that God um, told to the churches here in Acts chapter 15. Out of those four things, three of them 
are part of the mass of the Catholic Church. Part of the mass. Yes, ma'am. Um, like a maybe a like a spiritual fornication. Yeah, I could I could see that. I could. Sure. Right. I could see that. If I was sitting down talking to a, to a Roman Catholic and trying to convince them from the Bible, I would, I would go with the three. I would go with, number one, you're eating things strangled. Number two, you're eating food offered to idols. And, not, and number three, um, what was the other one? Oh, oh, you, oh you're, you're drinking blood. And God said no. Now, God never said, unless, of course, it's my blood, then you can drink it. But if it's not my blood, you can't. God never said that. He never said that. So, he, so at least three of those four things, every Catholic church is guilty of them. They're told not to do it. Okay? Now... Genesis chap chapter 6. Uh, let's see here. No, we've already done that. Let's go. Let's go. Um, I want to move along here. Turn to. Let's see here. Yeah, turn to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, just to kind of move along. I'm, I'm trying to show you all the different giants and where they're placed in the Bible and so on. Uh, I'll never forget the, uh, I ended up making two videos on the giants several years ago. And um, it was based upon a guy, and I don't know who he was. But he, he left a, a post on Facebook that said, that talked about all of us idiots who believed that the giants were the, were the literal offspring of, uh, of angels and human women. And he said, uh, you've gone against the Bible. You've gone after the, the teachings of uh, the, um, of the book of Enoch and you swallowed that garbage and so therefore uh, you bunch of heretics who believe that and so I wrote him back in in private and I said can you show me now what you just said and what you came up with can you show me um, where the doctrine is that the giants came from Seth, because that's their story. And he wrote back and he said, oh, come on, Mike. I love that when they do that. Everybody knows. And I went, uh-uh. I don't want to hear what everybody knows. I want to read it from the Bible. What the Bible knows. And he said, Oh, you mean you read and follow the book of Enoch too? I said, no, I don't. As a matter of fact, I don't. I said, I have read the book of Enoch. I think it's a, just a pile of garbage if you ask me. And I said, I don't think there's anything to it. I found out what I found out in the Bible. And he never did answer me back. So I'm going, okay, I'm going to get you, buddy. And I did. I sat down and I was stunned at what I found. Just that number one, just the, the number of places in the Bible where it mentioned giants and talked about all the giants and things like that. And uh, and some of the doctrine related to it. And then I was really, really amazed that uh, Paul, who I think wrote the book of Hebrews, 
Paul's doctrine of salvation, how he's teaching it from the book of Hebrews is that he's illustrating it using the giants. And he said that there were uh, Israelites that when they went in and spied out the land and they come back and they say, we can't go in there. There's giants all over the place. They'll just step on us like grasshoppers and kill every one of us. We can't go in there at all. And how and Paul said in Hebrews, he said, that shows you how much faith they didn't have. They had no faith whatsoever because if they would have believed God like Joshua and Caleb did, they would have said, come on, boys, let's go in and take that land like God said we could go in and take it. That's our faith right there. And that's our salvation is that we believe what God said in his word. We act upon that belief and we go do what God said. And I, boy, I think it would have made an awesome movie. Amen. An outstanding movie of how the Israelites go in and, they, and Moses sends, you know what? Tell you what, let me just send in, oh, I don't know, 120. 10 from each tribe. You guys go back, you guys go out there and kill all those giants and come back before dinner. All right? I thought that would be awesome. So we have in Revelation 13, the, the false prophet causeth all. And there's six things here. Count them. Small and great. Rich and poor. Free and bond. Six things. Um, and it says, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Right in here. Uh, the Watchman broadcast that I've been putting out last couple of weeks has sort of been dealing with this. In the Hindu religion, it's called a bindu or a bindi. And um, to anyone who is a Hindu, if you have that dot on your forehead, and it, that's what it literally means, a spot. And But the Bible tells us that we are to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. So anybody who accepts Hindu doctrine, somebody, oh, I don't know, like <coughs> Rick Warren or somebody like that, who, th who thinks that we all believe in the same God, but we don't, because our God doesn't have 330 million different names. Um, but anyway, they believe that they, that dot or that spot that goes on the forehead is a sign that they have been enlightened. And in that, it's no different than what the Catholic Church does on the day of Lent. Is they put a mark on everybody's forehead, don't they? They do. I wouldn't do that. You couldn't make me do that. Don't put a mark on your forehead. Amen. Just don't do it. But that's what they do. And uh, they put that mark there on their forehead. And they believe that that shows that they have enlightenment. And that they have been in contact with the gods and the chief of the gods, Brahma. And, uh, and so now you have clairvoyance. You can see well. You can see the spirit realm and so on. And so... Um, we now see it as the mark of the beast and we wouldn't we wouldn't have it so that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the th there's three things here the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name here is wisdom let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man Notice that it is the number of two things. This is a hybrid number. It is the number of a beast. It is also the number of a man. And his number is 603 score. 
and 6. What do you make of that? Where it says it's the uh, number of a beast, but also the number of a man. What do, you, what do you think you believe in that? Or what do you see in that? Any ideas? Huh? The beast and the, and the, the man... Same thing, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes, Mama? Well, yeah, that's what I have up there, Cubby. That's pretty. You're really smart, Cubs fan. It's his team, I don't know. But, yeah, I agree. I think that this beast is a man and he's a beast a hybrid okay so I was going to ask this question earlier do monkeys go to heaven do uh, 97 pound carp go to heaven huh All right, I'm setting you up. I'm setting you up for something. Okay? Do, um, do um, hyenas go to heaven? No, hyenas don't go to heaven. Does your pet dog go to heaven? Do what? According to Disney, yeah. Yeah, believe it or not, believe it or not, I've had arguments with people on that issue. They have argued with me, told me how wrong I was, uh, that I don't believe that, uh, they believe that their dog is going to heaven uh, because there are animals in heaven and that proves it right there. And... Um, there are beasts in heaven because God made them, the angels, beasts. Okay, that's all through the Bible. It's everywhere. I believe that uh, the heavenly realm is, of course, a, a picture of, the, of this earthly realm. I think one is, a, is an example of the other, or one is a picture of the other. And... Um, so anyway, I, no, I don't believe your pet poodle goes to heaven, doesn't go to doggy heaven or anything like that. Uh, there are people who believe that when they get to heaven, that little Wagsies is going to be sitting at the gates of Pearl, his little tail shaking, and he's going to wait for them to come into the heavenly gates. One, one of the biggest problems I have with that is who said that that person's going to heaven? That's one of the problems I have with it. But anyway, so we do have uh, uh, hybrids in the Bible. Genesis 14, 12 years they served Kedolay armor, and the 13th year they rebelled. And in the 14th year came Kedar, Kedor Laomer, and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims. Rephaims were giants. Smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth Carnium. And, uh, and the Zuzims in Ham. Zuzims were giants. Okay? Uh, in Ham. And the Emims. The Emims were giants. In, Sh in Sheba and Kiriathim. And the Horites. They were giants. Uh, in, their, in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came unto in Mishfat which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, giants, and so also the Amorites, giants, and dwelt in Hazes on Tamar. And there went out uh, the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, 
the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the Vale of Siddim, with Kedar Laomer and the, and the king of Elam, uh, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of uh, uh, Elasar, four kings with five. So we just, we just identified, uh, let's see, what do we have here? We have uh, the, um, uh, the Rephaims, the Zuzims, the Emims, the Horites, uh, who else do we have here? Uh, let's see, yeah, which the, 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 they returned and came to Israel. I can't, but I can't remember all of them. The Malachites, but all of these nations were nations of giants. They were men of great stature. They were huge men, uh, and yet their armies were defeated. Then I like this one. Turn your oh, you, turn your Bible to Joshua. You like this? This this is going to be coming up in the uh, in the Watchman uh, broadcast when I get when I get through editing these and putting them out. Take your Bible. Turn to Joshua chapter twelve. Man, oh man! Uh, if there was ever a place in the Bible where I see Jesus killing the giants, it's right here. Joshua chapter 12, verse 1. Now these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side toward Jordan, toward the rising of the sun, and from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon, and unto all the plain of the east. Sion, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon and ruled from Arior, um, which is upon the bank of the river Arnon and from the middle of the river uh, and from half of Gilead, even unto the river Jabbok, which is the border of the children of Ammon. And then in verse four, and the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelt in at Ashtaroth and at Edrei and uh, reigned in Mount Hermon and and in Salcon and in, in, uh, in all of Bashan unto the border of the Geshurites and the Maacathites and half of Gilead and the border of Sion, king of Heshbon. So we have two giants mentioned here. We have uh, Sion, king of the Amorites in Joshua chapter 12, verse 2. And then we have uh, uh, Og, king of Bashan, which is Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 12, Verse four, both of those men were of humongous heights. What did we say about Og, king of Bashan? His, his bedstead was nine, nine cubits of iron, which turns out to be about 13 and a half feet. That's pretty big. That's very big. That's not just tall basketball tall. That's big girth muscles. Okay, and how is it that he gets to be king? Nobody can stop him from it. Amen. Okay, he gets to be king. Now, what I want you to do with this for a little bit is think of what it is in your life that you cannot defeat. That if you could say, be gone. I'm talking about your sins. If you could say to your sins, be gone. And they just went away forever. Which ones would they be? Now turn to Joshua 12. Joshua 12, these are the kings of the country in verse 7, which Joshua and the children of Israel smote on this side, Jordan on the west from Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon, even unto Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, which Joshua gave unto the tribes of Israel for possession according to their divisions. So look at verse 9. The king of Jericho, 1. The king of Ai, 2. Which is beside Bethel, 1. The king of Jerusalem, 1. The king of Hebron, 1. The king of Jarmuth, 1. The king of Lachish, 1. The king of Eglon, 1. The king of Gezer, one. The king of Deber, one. The king of Geder, one. The king, uh, let's see, verse 14. The king of uh, Horma, one. The king of Arad, one. The king of Libna, one. The king of Adullam, one. 
The king of Makeda won. The king of Bethel won. The king of Tapua won. Uh, let, let me go back to this. Verse 16, the king of Bethel won. Do you think that there is a devil that would like to tear this church completely apart? I'm telling you, there is. And it usually, usually starts with me. And then he starts working his way down to other people in my family. Starts working on John and his family. Brother Sterling, his family. Starts working in all of our families, all of our men. Starts working in all of them. Okay, and if we could say, devil be gone, we would have done it already. Okay, but I think having a devil around sure makes for good hunting. Sure makes for a good fight. And there are times when I'm up for a good fight. I'm up for a good one. Times when I'm not, so <laughs> don't. <laughs> but there are times when I'm ready for a good fight. Okay, and uh, I'll, I'll be ready to take this devil on because he's he's caused a lot of grief here. So there is a king of Bethel. Uh, now move on, verse seventeen. The king of Tapua won. The king of Hefer won. The king of Aphek won. The king of Lasheron won. Verse nineteen. The king of Madon won. The king of Hazor won. The king of Shimron Miron won. The king of Aksaf won. The king of uh, Teanak won. The king of Megiddo won. The king of uh, Kedesh won. The king of Jocneum of Camel won. Um, verse 23, Kamala Harris won. The, <laughs> That's pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> the king of Dor in the coast of Dor won. The king of the nations of Gilgal won. The king of Tirzah won. All of the kings, 30 and 1. That's the ones that Joshua killed on the other side of Jordan. But Moses killed two on this side of Jordan. So 31 plus 2 is how much? So who killed him? Christ. Amen. Isn't it neat to see that? That out of all these giants. One man. Killed them all. Amen. We have a mighty Savior who fights big battles. Amen? Big boy battles. And he's not ever scared of any of them. I love it. Uh, Goliath is a hybrid. Think about it. There went, out of, uh, there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and, his, and he, he was armed with a coat of mail. And the, coat of the, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. That's got to be heavy. That's got to be heavy. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders and the Staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. That's got to be heavy. And one bearing a shield went before him. That's, that's all got to be big stuff, okay? So Goliath was one. Then we have Goliath's hybrid brothers. My goodness. 
Uh, there was again in uh, this second Samuel 21, there was a, again a battle in Gob with the Philistines and uh, El Hanan, the son of J.R. J.R. Oregon. J.R. Oregon. Thank you, God. I don't have to pronounce them right to get in the pearly gates. Amen. A Bethlehemite slew the brother of Goliath. Did you know that the NIV says slew Goliath? Yeah, it does. How stupid can you get? That's pretty stupid, isn't it? To deliberately put in your Bible, he slew Goliath. Oh, you idiot. I learned it. And I learned it in vacation Bible school. I learned it in Sunday school that it was David that killed Goliath. Amen. Um, but anyway, he slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath. And there was a man of great stature that had uh, on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. Four and twenty in number, and he also uh, was was born, and he also was born to the giant. And when they when he defied Israel, Jonathan the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the Gat, to the giant in Gath, and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Man, I tell you what, those were some mighty men back in those days. Amen. You know what those were? Those were men that had faith. Those are men that believed and trusted God. Those are men that weren't afraid when it came time for battle. They weren't afraid. They said, boys, let's go. Let's go get these guys. Let's tear it all down and let's kill them just before nightfall so our children don't have anything to worry about. Sometimes it'll do us some good to do some battle with some giants every now and then. Amen. Just so God can show us what kind of warrior he is for us. And just so God can put it in us to know that, yes, we can kill giants by faith with God's grace. Amen. Now, some people ask the question, but these can't be angels marrying human women because God does not allow that. So in Matthew twenty two twenty nine, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So he says, your problem is not the scriptures. Your problem is you don't know the scriptures. That's your problem. Because the scriptures do not lie. And they can't be wrong. What's rule number one? The Bible's never wrong. Rule number two, if someone says it's wrong, refer back to rule number one. The Bible's never wrong. So you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they, meaning your friends and loved ones and so on, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God, where? In heaven. That's, how, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, now you know the scriptures. Now you know what it means. It's not the angels that are in heaven that did this. Jude says they left their first estate. They came and they came down like like we saw in Psalms 82. I have said, ye are gods and all of you children of the most high, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. God showed me that verse one night and I went, there it is right there. Black and white, plain as day. It's right there in the scriptures. They fell from heaven and upon falling, now they have the ability to mate. 
Amen. Um, let's turn to. Oh, yeah, I like this one. Jude chapter, Jude, of course, Jude only has one. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. There it is right there. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Uh, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner forgiving or giving themselves over to fornication and going after what? Strange flesh. That means human flesh. Strange. Or in, the, in this case, let's see. Um, yeah, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And then uh, in Genesis, we've gone back to that again. That's what they did. They went after strange flesh. They went after flesh that wasn't theirs. Psalm 82, this is what I was reading earlier. Go ahead and turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to take a little break and then we'll go to that uh, and we'll, uh, if you have any questions, uh, submit them now, uh, and we'll talk about them after our break. Psalm 82 verse six, I've said, ye are all gods and all of you are children of the most high, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. And that was number one. Um, let me ask you this. Who believes that a ship not of this world crashed just outside of Roswell, New Mexico. Okay. I believed it, but I, I wanted Bible proof. If the Bible doesn't say it, I won't. And I didn't. I made some videos on UFOs, but I made no claims about Roswell whatsoever. And, um, oh, by the way, I'm, I got a strike against my channel in YouTube. They said I gave out medical misinformation from something I said in... 2015, I think. So for a week, I can't upload anything. Nothing. I, I hate censorship. I really do. So anyway, if you, uh, they, the, my videos are still seen there. It's just that I can't upload anything there for a week. And then... I think by Wednesday that'll have gone away. Anyway, it literally happened like this. Uh, we were getting ready to go to Fargo, North Dakota for their, um, they call it a, their spring prophecy conference. Spring doesn't start until mid-July up in Fargo. <laughs> Sorry to let you know that. And uh, But anyway, I'm and I've got stuff prepared to talk about UFOs and I'm wanting to talk about Roswell but I can't I can't do it because I don't have any Bible and I'm up at one o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost said you're gods and all of you children of the Most High but you shall die like men and fall and I went that's it. So I opened my Bible up and looked at it. Shook my head, cried a little. Said, God, that's it. That's it right there. What happens is that these things, God lets them come down. They crash. Because God has altered the physical appearance of their body, the physical structure of their body. They are children of the Most High, which means sons of God. 
That's another word for it, children of God, children of the Most High. Uh, but they're going to die like human beings and fall like princes. And then you have the backup verses to that. Uh, you have uh, Ezekiel 28, where Lucifer wants to sit on the throne of God, but God won't let him. And so he dies like a man. Isaiah 14, same thing. He wants to sit and be like the Most High. God won't let him. So he makes him fall down like, uh, like, like any man would fall down and die like we would. Uh, I'll tell you what I believe. Let me, let me read this. Uh, and I do like it. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Do you believe that the verse numbering of the KJV was God inspired? If not, how do you explain the patterns found throughout the scripture that only... Uh, appears consistent uh, only in the King James. Well, here, here's what I'll say to that. Uh, and of course, a lot of people won't believe it. That, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Um, let's say that... Let's say that um, Leonardo da Vinci painted one of his absolute best paintings ever even he looked at it and said that it's my best painting ever I like it I love it um, and so he says uh, to one of his aides he says go to Walmart and get me a, uh, a frame for this painting because I want the very best frame that I can get. I know they got them down at Walmart. Go down there and get me the, I mean, best frame that they've got down there. So he goes down there, $12 later, he's got him a frame for this, this painting that years later sold at auction, you know, for $43 million or whatever. Okay? Doesn't sound right, does it? Okay? When you have, when you have, the, the greatest work that history has ever known. And, and let me say this about the King James. Uh, it has in, it's not just inspired um, people to become Christians. It's not just inspired those Christians to believe in the one true God. This Bible has had an influence on the way you and I all talk, uh, euphemisms that we use, things that we say that are part of our speech that we don't even question where they came from and and what you know how we came about them, but um, you know there they are, and this this Bible literally has had uh, an influence on uh, at least every English-speaking country, nation, or peoples, but even upon those who are not natural English-speaking people. It's, this book has had an influence on them, on the way they speak, on the way they talk, on the way they live their lives. I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing uh, the way this book has um, influenced um, history since at least 1611. I'll say that. And um, so if, if, I'm, if I'm God, and um, I actually have something I think in my notes about when the, when the verse numberings first came in. Uh, I don't know if I'll get to it today, but anyway... Uh, if I'm God, and this is without a doubt the best work of art that I've ever produced, ever, uh, for all of mankind to see, uh, I think I put it in a frame that is equally befitting um, the beauty um, I don't know how to, I don't know the words to use. The absolute beauty that the words of this book belong in, they belong in the absolute best frame 
that you could ever, ever possibly dream up. And I see uh, in many cases the verse numberings um, and chapter numberings and so on as a part of that. When I see um, a, a chapter like chapter 666, when I see that chapter, and like I've said so many times before, I'm looking for the name of the beast, but it's not there in chapter 666. But what is there is another verse telling me to study numbers and you get wisdom from that. That just, it may just make sense to me. It looks like that's in the right place. Um, the number 10 is the number for dominion. Uh, the number for, um, well, dominion, the number for ruling, um, the 10 kings with the 10, the 10 horns that the beast has on his head. He's got 10 horns. Those are the 10 kings. He rules with them. Um, the 10 toes that are on the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, um, they, they have a time when they are going to rule. They represent ten kings as well. And um, so when I look in Genesis 10, and I see the very, very first king ever mentioned in Genesis 10, to me it makes sense that it's there. And uh, I can't get around that. I can't excuse it away now that I know it's there. I look at it and I say, you know, that's interesting. That's, that's where the first king is. It's in Genesis 10. Wow, that, that kind of makes sense. And so that was a, a class that I took in Bible college. Uh, verse numberings 103 or whatever. Uh, but the more, I, the more I look at certain verse numberings, certain things and so on, the more I, 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 have to, I have to say it looks like it just belongs in certain places. Certain, certain verses, certain doctrines, they, they look like they, they belong where they are. It's about all I can say to it. Um, are they inspired by God? Well, they would, uh, they would, I would say they would have to be put there by God. Whether that's an inspiration thing or not, I don't know. But I would say that it looks like God put them there. Okay? It's, it's the penny theory, on the penny on the sidewalk. Okay? You just keep looking for pennies. Okay? So I keep finding pennies on the sidewalk. Well, uh, let's say that every hundred pennies, I find a penny roll. Right? What do you do with a penny roll? Put pennies in. And I'll be going, I'll be doggone. Look at there. How many pennies have I got? A hundred. Look here, there's a penny roll right here. I'll be. Okay? So that's kind of my, that's my answer to it. I'll be doggone. There's a penny roll there. All right. Uh, was there another question up here? Mike. Yep. I can just uh, add a little something substantive back to what you're saying. Um, I, that tends to be the elephant in the room in a lot of churches. It's a topic that nobody wants to address for fear of you know, being a heretic, whatever the case might be. But we, we go to see something. Yeah. And number two, I was trying to find it, but we see in Scripture that there is already a natural order to the, the, the number of, for example, songs. Um, and, and there's a, there's a verse that uh, specifically attributes the number of, of songs or proverbs that were written and, and, and states the number of them, and you can find that the Bible 
Let me say this, and you mentioned something that, that fits in. Uh, something to understand about Bible colleges and seminaries, okay? Is that that is, that is a lot of where, um, a lot of, well, I'll just call it for what it is, stinking thinking. It, it is where a lot of stinking thinking comes from concerning the Bible. Uh, I went to two different Bible colleges, so I know that I'm probably pretty close on this. And they were fairly, fairly conservative, okay? Um, but the idea that if it, if, it, if it wasn't in the original manuscript, then it's not of God, period. Okay, and that's how every Bible college, Bible seminary, that is that is a rule that has persisted over the over the many many years that Bible colleges, seminaries, Bible um, Bible institutes, any kind of any kind of training. Uh, place where they train men uh, in the pastorate and train men to become preachers, bishops, and so on, is that if it if it's not in the original manuscript, then it it does not exist, will not exist, and um, will make sure that no one ever learns it. Okay. <laughs> We'll make sure. We'll ridicule anybody who say that it does. We'll make fun of them. We'll ridicule them. We'll tell them, I'm sorry, but this is not in the original manuscripts. Therefore, God had no intention whatsoever of, of letting that into his scripture. And so that's going to be their answer. Bottom line. Okay. Wasn't in the original manuscript, so it doesn't. It doesn't belong there, and uh, that's just that's just how they see it. All right, all right. First uh, Corinthians fifteen. This will be our last session. First Corinthians fifteen, verse thirty-six uh, through forty, is answers the question: um, Do Angels have DNA. Do angels have DNA? And um, I think the answer, once you read this and study it and just kind of meditate on it, I think the answer is clear uh, that they, they actually do. And so, but let's read it from the scriptures starting in verse 36. Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And uh, that, is, that is the theme that God led me on the night before I was to uh, bury my father down in... Uh, Arkansas, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the church, I've gone, uh, what is it, um, well it just blew, it just left my brain completely, um, I can't think of it, anyway it's in central Arkansas, and uh, we have, there are several of our family there, it's sort of like the family cemetery, it's what it is, and um, my dad is buried there. My grandparents are, are buried there. My cousin, uh, Debbie, who was me and Melissa's favorite cousin, um, 
she's buried there. My great grandmother and grandfather are buried there and some of their some of their other children are buried there as well. Uh, but anyway, while, while I was pondering the night before what I was going to say, uh, I just, God, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. And then the Holy Ghost again came through and just whispered um, these words. He that, he that goeth forth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And I went, that is so neat. I would have never thought of that alone. I know that. But that was the Holy Ghost coming through for me. This is what God wanted me to say. Mike, stop, stop saying you're burying your dad. You're planting his seed. And that made all the sense to me in the world. So that's what Paul is getting at here. Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. Don't you understand, people, that the people that you love, that you want to go to heaven, if they have a chance to go to heaven, then you have to let them go. You have to let them go. And um, so th this is why we've been asking everyone to pray for our family. Um come this Monday uh, because the doctor has um, said that when Brother Sterling um, gets on the table to have his uh, hip replacement surgery done, he may not make it off the table. And that's not going to that's not going to be good. For uh, my wife, for my wife's family, for all of our children, uh, for me, for this church. Um, he is a good man. He is a great man in our church. And um, so we ask that you that you pray for him. OK, but. He wants to go to heaven. And. I don't want to stand in the way of that. I don't want to stand in the way of that. And so just pray for us and pray for him and pray for God to do what God is going to do. Amen. But anyway, verse 37, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. Underline that. Draw arrows to it. Okay. Explode a firecracker on the page. Get some excitement in there. Amen. Because that's what it is. If it's got a body... It has a seed. If it has a seed, it makes a body. And that's how it is. Now, if God had said anywhere in the Bible, anywhere in the Bible, that spirits do not have bodies, that's exactly what I would be preaching to you. I would be preaching it faithfully, and I would be believing it. But it, that's not what the Bible says. They have bodies. They are different than ours. But they are still bodies. Okay? Their substance is different. In other words, what they're made of. We are carbon-based life forms. Um, but there, theirs is not. Theirs is, I would, I don't know if, if I were to take a guess, phosphorus-based life, life forms. They're made of fire. That's what the Bible teaches us. They're made of fire. Uh, which is light. So they are light beings. And that's what they look like. So anyway, um, when 
their DNA is mingled with our DNA. Oh, man, what is that going to look like? <whistles> Wacky. Amen. Verse 38 again, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. And here he says it in very, very simple terms. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. The glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So we know what celestial means. Celestial is the same word from where we get the word ceiling. Okay. Celestial means from up there. Terra, terra firma is what's under our feet. Okay. And we walk on it and we're made from it. Yeah, we are. We're made out of dirt. And so our DNA came from the dirt. And when we die, our DNA is going to be turned back into the dirt from whence it, whence it came. And, uh, and I, I like this teaching. I love this teaching. Um, Think of, think of your body as a farmer's field. Think of your body as a farmer's field. Okay? And he is going to plant seed into your heart, into your life. And whatever is planted into your heart, into your life, what else is going to come up? Other than what was planted in there. This is why I think it's important uh, that when we are raising children, we need to be careful what is planted into those bodies, into those fields. Because the seeds of all kinds of terrible things can be planted. The devil will figure out a way to do it. Won't he? He will. He's a monster at it. He will figure out all kinds of ways to plant wicked, evil, vile, terrible things into that, into that farmer's field. And once it's planted in there, God help you if it starts to come up. Because then you're going to have to do some work. As a farmer, you're, if you're the parent and you own the children, you've got some work to do, moms and dads. Amen. Undoing what was planted into their young bodies. Undoing what was, what was, uh, what was put down into them. Sometimes it was put in by the, by the local school district. By the school, right? Some of it was put in by the local church that, ha that saw fit to have a vacation Bible school with transgendered people. Church saw fit that that was something positive for them to give to those kids. At that, that hey, stuff's wicked. Amen. Amen. Anyway, there are celestial bodies, the body's terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one. The glory of the terrestrial is another. Um, verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Look at that. See, it only gets better from here. Amen. It only gets better from here. It can't get any worse. Amen. Four years of Job 
Biden. By the way, folks, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't planning on being this way, so, so forthright, so outright. Uh, when I saw that bullet go within a half inch of his brain, I decided right then and there who I was going to support publicly to be president of the United States. And I'm not backing down from it. I, listen, somebody's got to be president. And I gave up years ago on it being a King James only fundamentalist preacher. And I, you know what? In some cases, I'm almost glad it was never going to be a King James. But anyway, um, it, we need to have somebody that's in the White House. I, he's not perfect. We're not going to get anybody perfect. Okay. Thomas Jefferson was not perfect, but he was a good man to run this country. Benjamin Franklin, of course, he was not president of anything. But uh, the man had some really, really good ideas. And uh, that's just how it is, and I'm not going to back down from it. Anyway, uh, the resurrection of the dead it is sown in corruption, is raised in incorruption, is sown in honor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown in a natural body, and raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. See, there's the spiritual body right there. Boom. That's how the Bible puts it. So this idea of a spirit... When people say, well, the, how, how can angels do that? I mean, they're spirits. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to get, you know, disgusting, but how does that work? They're, after all, they're spirits. And we all know that spirits are just, you know, like wisps of air or something like that. Uh, but that's not ever what the Bible says. Uh, when the two angels went and knocked on Lot's door... Their, fa their hands didn't go through the wood, did it? Uh, how, how do we do this? God told us knock on the door, but I don't get that part. Never did. Never could break that. I never, never did do that. They, they, could, they could touch the door. They, they, they had their feet washed. They had supper again, again for the second time. Um, just everything. The, the men of Sodom wanted to be the men of Sodom with them. And uh, the truth of it is, uh, those men uh, had a body of some kind uh, that could have interacted with the three-dimensional world that you and I exist in right now. And so, it just stands to reason then to me that uh, those men, those angels... If they were so inclined, they could have interacted with this world and vice versa. And uh, so anyway, uh, back in verse 45, 1 Corinthians 15, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit, meaning Christ. Howbeit, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is uh, natural. The natural body comes first. Then the spiritual body comes second. Um, verse 46, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. Verse 47, The, uh, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Say amen. We're going to get a new body one of these days. Amen. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And so as long as this body of ours is uh, 
flesh and blood, flesh and bone, flesh period. As long as it is this way, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We cannot do it. And so this body has to be changed, whether it's by death, then brought back to life. Or if we are alive and remain on that day, we will be instantly changed into that new spiritual body uh, and will stay that way forever. And let me throw this in while I'm talking about it. I believe that we're going to come back with Christ and rule with him for 1000 years. And we're going to do it perfectly because no, nobody on the earth will be able to bribe us. What are they going to bribe us with? We don't need money. We just walked on streets of gold. Amen. Uh, what are they going to do? Offer us food? We ate dinner with Jesus. Get out of here. Ain't got nothing I want. Oh, but you haven't seen this. You know, if somebody opens up a box and it's got gold in it. We look at it and we go, oh, you brought me some pavement. That's nice of you. Uh, now, let me let me go with this. We're going to change directions here with uh, just some things I collected in the UFO thing concerning what their purpose is. Uh, this book written by David Jacobs, he's written several books um, on the UFO subject. He, this one's called Walks Among Us or Walking Among Us. And in it, he says, it appears that the UFOs themselves and everything in them are made for abducting and processing humans. Hybridization and teaching and training abductees. The UFOs were manufactured exclusively for that program or for the program. Their purpose is in hybridization of humanity. Now, is that wacky? Is that way out of line? Not according to scriptures, it isn't. Uh, here's another one. Boy, my mouth's getting dry. I think this is, um, this might be from the same book. Through hypnotic regression, Virginia, that would be a, an assumed name, recalled being seated inside, quote, a birthing room aboard a spaceship where she was shown hybrid children. The beings told her to sing and hum to the fetuses and to touch the hybrid children around her. Um... Uh, this doesn't say this here, but I've read other instances where a, uh, a woman was abducted and she was taken up uh, to a ship and there were hybrid children up there. And they took her in the room and set her down and she didn't know what she was doing there. And so they all communicate telepathically and she asked them, what do you want me to do? And they said, play with them. They don't know how to. They don't know how to. So she sat for a while and she had a, you know, a ball or something like that. And was teaching them how to play. Remember I said something earlier today. Um, and that is, there's, there's something that these devils lack that we have that they don't have and it's called humanity we we have the ability we grow up we know how to play it, we, it comes natural with us um, we know how to 
be funny with one another. We know how to cut up with one another. Uh, we, we just know these things by nature that's part of us. But apparently, they don't. And so in this hybridization program, it's believed that they want her to sit with them and play with them in order to teach them how to do it. Um, the being told her to sing and hum the fetuses and to touch the hybrid children around her. She dreamed that a baby was brought to her in a white blanket. The baby, Virginia reports, was three months old and conversed telepathically already. During another abduction, a naked, almond-eyed woman showed her images of a nuclear war and told her the threat could be diminished through understanding. This is an extremely common report. Extremely common. A lot of the UFO books that I have, that I've read, when they speak of uh, the abduction process, they are shown images of nuclear wars going on, how mankind is going to destroy this planet and how bad it's going to be. And it's just going to be, oh, it's going to be awful. And the aliens just can't let that happen. If you've seen uh, the movie, um, oh, yeah, that one. You know what I'm talking about. Yep, you know what I'm talking about. Um, oh, what is it called? It's about an alien that lands in a ship. He lands in Washington, D.C., and... And he's going to try to tell the United Nations that, huh? No. Day, uh, Day the Earth Stood Still. Both versions basically deal with the same thing. And the first version that was done back in the 50s, uh, there's evidence to suggest that the CIA helped fund that movie. Because they wanted to try to get the message out to see what effect it would have uh, on mankind. Uh, but anyway, it was it was they were they were telling the people that you know yeah whatever for whatever you might be you might be good people and all that but you're going to destroy this whole planet and we just can't let that happen so we're going to put a stop to it. Uh, but anyway. Um, I have, I have seen this same account multiple times where aliens will show abductees that they're, they're good people, but they're going to destroy their own planet. And we're going to, we're either going to take and remove some of you off of this planet and put you on a different one, or, um, we're going to stop you from doing what you're going to do to this planet, one way or the other. Um, she was also told that pollution could cause genetic mutations. She says that there are multi-level messages in the cosmos and that the beings told her that I could work with them, uh, that they were not going to invade us, and, if that, uh, uh, and that if they had wanted to, they could have done that a long time ago. Not if Jesus stopped him. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Don't forget it. Um, they could have done it a long time ago. There are many different kinds of entities. She says we're part of a universal awareness. We should explore the mysteries of life, of our universe, uh, the life that our universe offers us. Um, Enough evidence has also been accumulated to point toward the nature and purpose of the abductors. They were extraterrestrials with advanced technology. They did not intend an attack, but neither were they carrying out a grab and tag wildlife sur uh, survey. This abduction program had been underway for years, as far back as the 1920s, according to some uh, reported childhood experiences and had an almost industrial scale with millions of humans taken, according to extrapolations from uh, the paper roll. I don't know what that is. I will tell you that 
down south of here, if you get on I-55 and go down to a town called Sykeston, Missouri, uh, it's a lot of farmland because it's right on the Mississippi Valley. And uh, back before Roswell, somewhere around 1941, there was a minister that was awakened in the middle of the night. Um, when asked what's going on, they said, well, there's been a crash. We need you to perform last rites. He wasn't a, he wasn't a Catholic minister. Uh, he may have been, um, I don't know, he, he wore minister's clothing. I don't know exactly what he was. But anyway, so he gets uh, so a last rites kit. He goes uh, to this field, this farmer's field out there, and he doesn't see a crashed airplane. What he sees is a crashed something out there in this field. Um he goes over to where uh, some military men are and a couple of uh, law enforcement men and they roll back this tarp and this man is like, there was three small bodies laying there, large heads, little spindly arms, spindly legs. And the, the minister is like, what is this? And uh, somebody from the, uh, from the police department says, just do the last rites, just do it. So he does last rites. Then the military guy comes to him, gets right in his face and it says, you did not see anything here tonight, did you? And he said, no, sir, I did not. They said, good, because your family will appreciate that. I mean, they threatened the guy. This is already back in 1941. Uh, that that happened just, like I say, about an hour and a half down from here is where that happened. Uh, let me keep reading here. An abduction life cycle of casual encounters during childhood intensification of capture, starting with puberty and sub subsidence subsidence uh, past the prime reproductive years fit the same pattern. The aliens appeared to be creating a race of human slash alien hybrids. In some accounts, abductees reported seeing scenes of a devastated or barren planet. In some other cases, a communicative alien said outright that they came from a dying planet or that they had a problem reproducing and so the idea was let's use the humans for that and uh, we can continue to uh, produce ourselves now take a look at these symbols what are they okay here's their meaning um, let me get a little Get a pen going here. The, the compass points up. Manley Hall says this. Uh, Fat Albert Pike says it. And he says that it represents the circle of the heavens. In other words, this. But it also the fact that it points up. He says that the square represents this, what they believed was the square plane of the earth. In other words, they believed the earth was flat. And it represented the square plane of the earth and the fact that it uh, points down to the earth. Uh, very quickly, the uh, compass also represents the male. The square represents the female. I'll let you figure the rest of that out. Okay? That's what those symbols mean. In fact, if you read, uh, if you want to read a hundred books on masonry, I could probably send you a hundred books on masonry and they would all say the same thing is that the compass represents what's in the heavens 
and the square represents what's in or on the earth and the fact that they are joined together means that they are going to join together is what that means there is no other meaning to it and I'm telling you I've read I don't know how many pages of Masonic literature not written by people who are like me who are on the outside looking in I'm telling you I've written or I've read uh, books papers articles written by Masons who are pro Mason who all say the exact same thing what you have in the middle is what happens when these two things are brought together okay it almost like is you're it's almost like you're following uh, Genesis chapter 2 when Adam said this is now flesh bone of my bone and flesh in my flesh she shall be called woman because she came from man therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall be one flesh so the idea is is that G that's in the middle they say it represents geometry or it represents golly G or it represents soap or whatever but it's a number One, two, three, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's the number seven, okay? Which has, it sort of goes along with uh, the seven heads of the beast and so on. Um, let's see here. Oh, yeah. This symbol here, the New King James Version. That's what really got me going on symbols. And uh, I learned early on that this symbol was a witchcraft symbol. Okay? It represented the idea of three witches together. One is a, a, a maiden witch. In other words, a young witch. The second witch is a mother. She's already been married, given birth. The third witch is called the crone. She's the aged woman. She has all the wisdom. And when they get together and do their spells, their spells carry a lot of power. Now, naturally, Thomas Nelson, who started printing the New King James Version, didn't put that in the front piece of their Bible saying, this is a witchcraft symbol. Obviously. Okay? So what they said was, the triketra is an ancient symbol showing us the, um, the fact that God is three and yet he's one. And I got to thinking about that and I'm going, you know, I don't think that that's what that means. And then you look in Acts chapter 17, verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, or stone, graven by art and man's device. So, Thomas Nelson Publishing says, it represents the Trinity. God said, oh no it doesn't. So who do you believe at that point? You have to believe what God said. You gotta do it every time, amen? Um, Deuteronomy 20, 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Psalm 25, 14, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. That's the main number one thing that God showed you. The thing, the main number one thing that God showed me was not the secret of masonry wasn't the secret of what the aliens have uh, at play and what they're going to do the greatest secret that God ever showed me was his covenant with mankind if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me hear you say amen. amen. All right. Now, I'm going to, let's see, where am I going with this? I'm going to move through a lot of this. Because I want to get to, John, did you pass those out already? Okay. Did you give me one? Can I have one? Okay, thank you very little. All right. Yeah, I don't want to go through all of this. Um, I've done several teachings on this. There we go. This, this is what I want to look at. Changing the DNA of the church. The DNA of the church is right here. The Bible of any church is its DNA. Okay? So, uh, Brother Wayne Dinwiddie, so good to see you here. I was, I was tickled to death when I heard you were coming up here. Brother Wayne's a good friend of mine. He's a good friend of this church. He's uh, he's filled in for me here and and um, I can't remember his brother's name, but he uh, he called here or he emailed here and told me where he lived. And he said, I'd like to find a good King James Bible church to go to, but I can't find any in my area. And I said, yeah, there's one there. So I sent him to Brother Wayne. You've been there how long? Almost a year. Almost a year. Amen. And uh, so I'm glad to have them here. What, what makes me and Wayne Didwitty, what makes me call him Brother Wayne, is the fact that we both have the same father. Okay? And, you know, just like me and my sister, we didn't always agree on everything. Especially when I did stupid stuff to her. Um, or vice versa. But she's my sister. And uh, she didn't like it when guys on the bus picked on me. And she'd stand up for me. You leave my brother alone, I'll tear your head off. And they scared of her. So we'd get off the bus and she'd hit me and she'd say, would you knock it off? As my sister, I love her. And um, what makes her my double sister is that we both had the same physical father and we both had the same spiritual father. And I like that. And so this, the Bible will be the DNA of a church, okay? And um, take your Bible, I'm not going to put this on the screen for you, take, take your Bible, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32 there's two different sets of DNA that can be used I've taught this before and I I'm going to continue to teach it until God says shut up Mike okay Deuteronomy 32 And um, look at verse 31. So let's say that, um, let's say that uh, something happens to me and a few years down the road, you, you get a new pastor he is not King James. And um, now he's going to eventually bring forth a different Bible into this church. And I'm going to say this. I love this church and I love all y'all. But the ones who stay here 
and let that pastor turn this church into something other than a King James church. The King James wasn't your father's DNA to begin with. That's a harsh statement. But it is true. It is true. Uh, so in, thir in Deuteronomy 32, 31, their rock is not as our rock. See the w difference in the word rock, how it's capitalized. And, and we, they, we would hear from the Bible college now, this is not in the original manuscript. So don't think anything of it. Well, I do. I think something of it. I think the King James translators did too. They capitalized the second rock to separate it from the first rock. I think they did the right thing. For their vine is the vine of Sodom. And the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes... Our grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. That's what, that's what wormwood is. Absinthe, wormwood. It's a real bitter, bitter thing. Uh, their clusters are bitter. Their wine, and wine is always like a symbol of blood. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. So... Uh, take, take this piece of paper you got here. Okay? Um, yeah, here we go. Look on the first page where it says John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now that's different from the King James. How? In the word men. I believe the King James says, I, well, I in fact, I don't even have to look there. I think it says man. The light of man. Am I right on that? Huh? Am I wrong? How dare you? Right here while I'm thinking about firing people, you're trying to get you're trying to get in my way, aren't you? Yeah, amen. Shut up. Life is light of men. Okay. But look at the next verse. In him on the paper, in him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. It's not the same. Okay? John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not grasp it. But in verse 5 of the 2020, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Which one's, which one's correct? Which one's incorrect? Did not grasp it. Okay, but I I think that the uh, the top one is from the uh, twenty or the yeah the uh, nineteen ninety five Bible, and the bottom one is from the twenty twenty New American Standard Bible. Yeah, this is New American Standard. So. If you've memorized part of this verse, or actually all of it, now you have to rememorize it. You have to go back now, and you can no longer rely on this because it's different now. And you say, well, it's not a big difference. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. There's, there's, there's less uh, of, of, I don't know how I can say this. It's less important how we put down words for a contract to buy a new car. My son sells 
cars. I never thought he was a car salesman. Buddy, he's a car salesman. I mean, he's selling them right and left. And, but he has to sign a contract, and so do they. They have to sign a contract. And when both of them have signed a contract, then there's been a car being sold, okay? And there's less importance to buying a new car than there is your eternal life. You understand that? There's more importance in the wording of you receiving eternal life and the contract that God makes with you to give you that eternal life. Because this is a legally binding contract that God has made with us. And if you ask me, Mike, can I change your Bible just a little bit? I say, no, no way. Why would you want to? Well, we, some things are better now than they used to be. We understand the Greek better and we have better manuscripts. And uh, I'm going, stop, 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 stop. It doesn't matter. This is the contract that I agreed to. I was nine years old when I entered into this contract with my God. And I'm glad that I did because God then has been offering me and giving to me forgiveness of sins ever since then. And I'm so glad that he has. Oh, let's go through this some more here. Amen. Amen. What was it? Lindsay bought some uh, garlic bread from Walmart last week. And she bought it, let it sit in the fridge a day, one day, and she gets it out. He's going to put it in the oven. It had the least little bit of mold on it. She threw the whole thing away. Stupid. No, I wouldn't eat it. Why would you want to? Amen? That's got a little bit of corruption on it. A little bit of corruption, that's all it takes. A little, a little leaven, leaveneth the lump, okay? So all it takes is a little bit. Um, look at some others. You go through, start looking through these here and, and if you find something that you think is really, really just sticking out to you, let me know. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Uh, and then all things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. Yeah. And they're, and they're, not, they're not similar to each other either. It doesn't... They didn't help it any. They made it worse. Yes, sir. Um, I don't see it here, but uh, John 1 1 is the biggest eyes for it. All they do is change one letter and it destroys the deity of Christ. Uh, sure, sure. I, I, you've heard me probably say that before, uh, but changing one letter in John 1 1. Actually, it skews your entire look out, your outlook of Jesus Christ. Is he divine or not? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Or in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God. If you add that letter to it, it does. It messes up your entire Viewpoint of who Jesus is. He's not divine. And once you have that firmly grasped into your mind, 
than every other thing that you see in the Bible that might lead you to think he's divine won't lead you to think he's divine because John 1.1 1, 1 says, no, he is a God, which means that he is a lesser God than God the Father is. And it will always mean that in your mind. I'm glad you brought that up. It does destroy the Godhead, which they don't believe in anyway. Uh, well, what was that going to be? Anyway, keep looking, keep looking. Who's got a good one here? 14? Chapter 1. And the word became, yeah, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, see, that's, that's a lie. He's not the only son from the father, is he? We are. We are sons of Jesus himself said it. I have said ye are gods and all of you children of the most high. Thank you. I couldn't remember which one it was. Um, yeah, but that's that's a good one. Oh, let's see here. You know, let me just let me point out to you um, John four nine. And I'm, I'm going to make my point here and then uh, I'll ask you some questions here in a little bit. But John 4, 9. Let me read it from the King James first. This is the, uh, what is this, the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. So in the King James, then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou... Being a Jew, ask us, drink, ask us drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So now in the, in the New American Standard from 1995, it says, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? And then below that, so the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, though you are a Jew, are asking me for a drink, though I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, the differences in these two verses from each other not that big. I'll be honest with you. They're not that big. So, why did they have to make it different anyway? Huh? They had to make a change in it in order to secure a new copyright. Okay. Uh, why is the Model T that Henry Ford made so famous? Does anybody know? First production line automobile. And how many years did he sell that Model T? Many years. Okay. Until... Practically everybody who was ever going to get a car got a Model T and that was the end of it. Okay. 
And then that got boring because everybody was getting the same kind of car. And I don't know who it was, but they came up with, they said, you know what? Let's introduce a new color to it because they were all black. Right? Let's do something different with the headlights. In fact, let's do something different with the whole front of the car. Okay? And see, what they were doing was they were figuring out a way that they, and this is done this way to this very day. They figure out a way to get the people who had already bought a car, get them to buy another one. Okay? Oh, you own a Model T? Well, that was great 15 years ago. Okay? Why don't you look at what Ford is offering now? And all of a sudden, boom, people wanted that new car. So that's somebody invented the model year for cars. Okay? Uh, the way I'm seeing this is that way. Okay? They had a, a 1995 version of the Bible. And they had it for all of those years. And then everybody got tired of the New American Standard Bible. They, they wanted to start selling newer Bibles. So the only way they could do it was to update and change the language so they get a new copyright on it. Once they have a new copyright in place, then we can start printing and selling new New American Standard Bibles and tell people, yeah, you've got a New American Standard. That, that, that's the old one. We're using the new one now. So let's say that, I don't, I don't know, uh, the Lockman Foundation, Dewey Lockman. The Lockman Foundation has the copyright on the New American Standard Bible. So whatever publishing company that publishes Sunday School Material, Vacation Bible School, uh, Bible College uh, Tools, or whatever, whatever companies were using the New American Standard Bible for their printing needs, now they have to go back and sign a new contract with the Lockman Foundation because they have new Bibles now and they're not offering the old Bibles anymore. We're offering the new ones. And if you want this, you have to sign a new contract, which is going to cost you more money. That's just a guess of mine. But I think that's what they're up to is somehow, some way this represents more revenue for the Lockman Foundation to change the model number. The, uh, the NIV has done it five different times. Major times. Major revisions since 1973. They've done it. And so now you can expect all the new Bibles to start doing that. Plus, then once this new Greek New Testament comes out, that's going to alter everything. The Bible companies are going to have to come out with a new translation based upon the new Greek. And it's going to keep going all over again. There is constantly, constantly, constantly going to be changes to the Bible. And it will never stop, will it? Can you, can you fathom in your mind why, with all of this money rolling in because of the new Greek and the new translations and the new Bibles and we updated the can you imagine a scenario where all the Bible publishers just quit making new ones? Nah. There's too much money involved. And that's what it is. The love of money still is the root of all evil. Okay. I want to take a few minutes and just uh, uh, to me, this is important uh, because you're the ones you're online. You probably get people that ask you questions about why you use the King James or what if I'm using the new King James? Does that hurt anything? Or if you have any questions related to the Bible translation issue. I know I'm not giving you much time here, but 
just as we close out tonight, if you have any questions related to the Bible translation issue. Yes? It's not a question, it's just a comment. But if you would say, do you want to water down God's word? Sure. I want to change it, yeah. Meddle not with them who are given to change, the Bible says. Okay, yes, Will. Exactly. That's, in, that's from the book of Proverbs. And it says that concerning the strange woman, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. So one of the reasons why uh, churches use a prayer labyrinth is that it keeps you going in a serpentine path. You don't know where you're going. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. The reason why that they're constantly changing the Bible is their ways are movable. Once you get it figured out based upon what you read in 1995, um, you know, that's something, you know, I, maybe I haven't thought of that. Maybe I could, I could come up with some number thing from the new King James and call it the new King James code. Yeah. And then I could get more money. Yeah. No, I think we'd probably lose a bunch anyway. Um, but yeah, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. That's exactly, I think I have in my notes here somewhere, but that's exactly it. It's to keep moving the, the goal line. Keep moving the mark. Keep moving the, the doorway to heaven. You keep doing that and people will never ever. I mean, have you ever met a Roman Catholic who knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that when they die, they're going to heaven? That idea doesn't exist. In, in, uh, exactly. You're more sure of going to purgatory than you are. Yes, Will. That's right. Exactly. Uh, this graphic uh, is several years old, but uh, this was what a company was uh, offering for the Free Will Baptist denomination and their youth ministry. They were going to have a, a, a youth conference, and the main theme of it was, how do I change the DNA of our church? It's real easy. Change the Bible. You change the Bible, you've altered the DNA of that church because whatever that, whatever sermons gets preached into that church, that's the DNA that's going into that church and that's what they're going to end up being. And if they're drinking from the vine of Sodom, guess what's, guess what's going to come? Okay, there's going to be an acceptance of sodomy, an open acceptance of sodomy, I'll say. Uh, anybody else? Just a statement. You've said it many times. That's why you have to stay in the Bible. And be wary, wary, wary. Amen. 24 7. Is that many hours in a day? Seven? No, oh, this is kidding. Amen. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, 945, come here. We're going to be doing some singing and, uh, several, several people from here are going to be singing and then, um, got a baptism. One of my granddaughters, she's so excited about this. In fact, she was so excited. She went out and got her arm broke, thought she wasn't going to be able to get baptized but they got the, they got the uh, thing off just in time. So now she's, now she's excited about it. So, um, amen.